I'm Dr. Wally Bartley, and I invite you to partake on an exciting educational journey related to public health theory, practice, and research. You shall discover on this learning adventure that the art and science of public health is inter- and multidisciplinary in nature, very complex and broad, and continuously evolving over time. In this lecture, we shall examine key concepts related to indigenous health. We shall critically examine the negative impacts of colonization, the residential school system in Canada, and indigenous people's belief, concepts, and healthcare challenges that they are currently facing. Now, let's begin our learning journey. So let's begin the lecture by first defining what does the term Aboriginal mean? Well, this is defined as Indigenous peoples who are and remain the earliest or initial inhabit inhabitants of a place or land. Currently, there are over 350 million Indigenous people representing more than 5,000 unique cultures in over 70 countries globally. Here in North America, we have a growing body of archaeological evidence, which actually uh, provides uh, proof that the first and earliest inhabitants of Canada and other parts of North America uh, really dates back quite a few years, uh, more than uh, 10,000 years in fact. And this predates any uh, European explorers that came to this continent. Indigenous beliefs are rooted in the context of oral history, art, and culture. So this is important to consider when looking after individuals and interacting with various Indigenous communities. Um, recording of their history is a relatively new phenomenon. So the oral tradition, or in the art forms as well, have been passed on for literally thousands of years, but the recorded recording of these um, is a relatively new phenomenon. Decisions surrounding one's health and well-being are often regarded as situational and highly dependent on the values of the individual within the context of their family and community. So indigenous perspectives of health and well-being emphasize a holistic and reciprocal relationship between the physical and spiritual world, the individual and their surrounding environment, and between the mind, body, and spirit. And often this is in direct contrast with the medical model of health. Spiritual and physical life. These include beliefs, uh, these beliefs include a reciprocal and balanced relationship between individuals and Mother Earth, which will help to provide a path to good life or by Madhazivan, an understanding of the relationship between Mother Earth and by Madhazivan provides the individual with the sustenance necessary for high quality spiritual and physical life. We often see this symbol, the circle, is very common in First Nations teachings. Of course, it represents equality. There is no hierarchy here. And we see them in, uh, in, in, in various art forms uh, as well, including dream catchers that you may be familiar with. The story of the sacred tree begins with the creator who decides to plant a sacred tree. And of course, the tree is, uh, is symbolic of a spiritual place where all people can assemble and acquire or achieve required healing, strength and power, knowledge and wisdom, <clears throat> and a sense of security and sanctuary. Here we see the First Nations medis uh, medicine wheels. They are considered powerful and sacred symbols of the universe, which depicts the circularity of life. It also helps to depict and encourages the balance between the required aspects of self, 
including the physical or body, the mental or mind, emotional and spiritual components. Totem poles date back to about the 1700s, um, and it remains an important symbol of Indigenous people who reside in Southeast Alaska, Northwest Pacific coasts in Canada and elsewhere. They actually began as uh, quite small uh, in nature, about the size of a walking cane, but, but over time has become uh, quite uh, grand in nature, often being you know, 25, 30 feet or even more in height. The word totem is derived from an Ojibwe word, ododam, which means his kinship group. So what does the term colonization mean? And this is important to understand the impact of colonization, and I'm referring to the negative impacts of colonizations on various Indigenous peoples, not only here in Canada, but globally as well irregardless if it was the French, the English, the Portuguese, the Spanish, etc., colonizations has always resulted in negative impacts on the indigenous people who first occupied their land. So colonization is defined as the process of establishing a colony or group of settlers in a new land or territory, whether previously inhabited or not, during which the settlers are both partially or fully subject to and accountable to their mother country of origin. In the Canadian context, we had French uh, colonizers who came first, and this was followed by England, the English colonizers. What were some of the social and health consequences associated with colonization? While French and English colonizers brought with them various communicable diseases that were previously non-existent to Indigenous populations in Canada. Uh, these included uh, STIs or sexually transmitted infections like syphilis and gonorrhea, tuberculosis, measles and smallpox to name but a few, which devastated tens of thousands of First Nations and Inuit people. Indigenous healing practices. Well, when European colonizers and explorers first arrived here, they were quite astound, astounded and surprised to learn about the extensive healing and medical practices known by First Nations people. For example, cup, cupping, and cupping is an ancient form of alternative healing where a priest or healer uh, puts a heated cup on the skin to create a suction or vacuum. And these are used, for example, to decrease pain, inflammation, to promote uh, blood flow. And it is also regarded as a, as a form of deep tissue massage. They were also astounded to learn that they could set broken bones quite competently, uh, perform uh, amputations uh, and cauterization of vessels, and also phlebotomy. Phlebotomy uh, during this period of time was all the rage uh, in Europe, or bloodletting, if you wish. Here we see a smudging bowl, which is a shell, and often sage and, and other herbs are often, uh, and sacred plants are often placed into it. And smudging is traditionally a ceremony for purifying or cleansing the soul of negative thoughts of a person or place by burning sacred herbs, herbs and, and plants. Here we see on the right a picture of willow herb plant. It, it grows quite prominently in, in many parts of uh, uh, in Canada, especially on the prairies and in Europe as well. Uh, when I spent some time out west in Manitoba, I often interacted with uh, First Nations uh, in, uh, healers, and I was astounded uh, to, uh, to learn that they were still using this plant to actually treat uh, various infections of the wound, and I was intrigued. Um, and we know today that AB resistance or antibiotic resistance is a growing public health concern globally uh, due to a lack of research into developing new antibiotics by pharmaceutical industry, which is driven first and foremost by profit. 
for example, if you administer an antibiotic, uh, you know, for two weeks, it's not as, or develop an antibiotics, uh, which often uh, costs millions of dollars to develop and research and market, um, and it's only administered for a two week period, it's not really profitable in terms of re return on investment. However, if they invest in a medication, such as a cholesterol lowering medication or blood pressure medication or an antidepressant where an individual will have to take this medication for several decades or for the remainder of their life, it is much more profitable to invest in, in, in these forms of research in terms of their return on investment. Anyways, I mentioned this anecdotal evidence uh, that when I was speaking to First Nations healers about the use of this willow herb for treating infected wounds. Uh, and so what we decided to do is to conduct a lab-based experiment to actually to confirm some of these antibacterial properties of willow herb grown on the Canadian prairies. So we did a lab-based experiment and we took raw uh, willow herb extract, the whole plant extract, and what we found is, uh, much to our ast astonishment, that uh, willow herb was found to be uh, quite potent in its, uh, in its ability uh, to inhibit the growth of, growth of both gram-positive and gram-negative uh, bacteria. And we can see some of them uh, noted here on this, on, on, on this slide. Um, it actually was uh, surprising also to, found, to find that willow herb inhibited the growth of bacteria in culture more effectively than commercially available controls, including uh, antibiotics like vancomycin and tetracycline. So this may offer hope uh, in the development of, uh, of a new antibiotics. Formal recognition of all Indigenous people in Canada. Well, in January 2013, the federal court in Ottawa ruled that the Métis and non-status Indians have the same rights as status treaty Indians in accordance with the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The Indian Act of 1876. Having the designation and status as an Indian in Canada is acquired via a birth status and is also defined by the Canadian Indian Act of 1876. A treaty or registered Indian or First Nations person is an ind individual who is recognized under this specific Canadian uh, Indian Act of 1876 and also has obtained a unique registration number known as a treaty number. And the vast majority, approximately 98% of First Nations people living on reserves uh, across Canada are in fact regarded as status Indians. The Inuit, some historical or origins. While the Inuit are believed to be descendants of the Thule culture, it dates back to 1000 BCE and consisted of eight separate, separate tribal groups. According to the 2016 uh, Canadian census, uh, over 65,000 individuals identified themselves as being Inuit or Inuk in, in, uh, uh, in origin. Uh, here on the right, we see a traditional Inuit sealskin outerwear. outerwear. Um, the Inuit people of Canada are in fact renowned for their ability to adapt and survive in harsh environments and cold, cold, cold climates of Northern Canada and the Arctic regions here in Canada and other parts of the world too, including parts like Greenland, for example. Inuit homeland, approximately three quarter of Inuit in Canada, or about 40,000 individuals, live in one of the four regions within the Inuit Nunaat regions in Canada. This is in the northern parts of Canada, as shown on this map. And this is the Inutituk expression for Inuit homeland, a region which stretches all the way from Labrador to the Northwest Territories. 
So what are the some of the negative health effects related to changes in traditional diets? So this is an example. This is one of the consequences of colonization um, that has impacted Indigenous people across Canada. Well, basically there has been changes, for example, to traditional fishing, trapping, and hunting lifestyles uh, due to contamination of the environment, uh, which is critical for these communities. For example, there have been uh, um, uh, increased levels of mercury, PCB, dioxin contamination in water and, and, and in soils. Um, and so this has resulted in an increased reliance on highly processed, commercially available foods. So uh, traditionally, indigenous people uh, used to hunt animals or fish, and they were told you shouldn't eat these because, of course, they are contaminated now with these various, uh, various poisons. Over time, this has resulted in um, uh, a greater incidence of lactose intolerance. Uh, we see increased incidence of diabetes mellitus, uh, uh, adult onset, DM for short, obesity in both children and adults, which are growing public health concerns uh, in indigenous populations in Canada. Of course, food in many northern parts of Canada are extremely expensive because uh, they often have to be flown in, in, in into remote communities by airplane, which, uh, which increase associated costs. Or during the winter, uh, they are trucked uh, with so-called um, ice truckers who drive over frozen lakes, quite a, a hazardous and, and treacherous route to say the least. And of course, these food items become very, very high priced in nature. So here are just some examples um, of prices in Nunavut as of 2019. So we see, uh, you know, some orange juice on the top left is over $26. Uh, Swep's ginger ale for a case of 12 cans is over $82. If you want to buy fresh strawberries, it's over $14, one of those little pints. Uh, Catelli spaghetti, just a box of spaghetti is uh, $18, over $18. Uh, frozen pizza, uh, it's $27. Um, and of course, pub style chicken burgers are over $32. So this gives you a snapshot of some of the outrageous food prices in some of these uh, remote communities. The Inuit languages. Um, are divided into the following two main types. Inupiat or Inuit types that are spoken in Labrador, Northern Alaska, and the Arctic coasts of Canada. And the Yupik types that are spoken in uh, Southern Alaska and also in uh, Siberia. Um, here we see an example from Nunavut, some, uh, a stop sign uh, uh, over there, how it looks like. I think that was pretty cool. And Inuktitut language is strongest in the region of Nunavik and Nunavut, where more than nine out of 10 Inuit can speak the language well enough to carry out a conversation. Now, I mentioned earlier in this presentation that the oral history is very uh, important. And this is how they pass on their culture traditionally and in art. Uh, but now through the use of technology, many of these traditional languages, uh, different in, in indigenous languages, uh, Inuit and First Nations and so forth, are being preserved uh, by, um, by elders, uh, recorded on video and so forth, so for future generations uh, can learn it and it can be preserved in, in, in a more tangible sort of format, more accessible format uh, for future generations and for scholars to study and what have you. Who are the Métis? Well, these are individuals joined between the union typically of a First Nations and non-Indigenous parents and are legally considered the same as non-status Indians. The first records of Métis people are shown as early as 1600 on the east coast of Canada. There are large populations of Métis located on the prairies in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, uh, notably. 
Um, here we see two symbols, two MATI symbols. Uh, the one on the left uh, is in red, uh, which kind of symbolizes that it was a union between the First Nations and typically a Scottish uh, trapper or explorer. And of course, the blue represents sort of a French origin. And that sign almost looks like an infinity sign. These are symbols that are used by, by Métis. Jesuit missionaries. So following colonization, of course, the Jesuit missionaries came to, uh, to Canada, or previously known as Kanata, which is a First Nations word, uh, incidentally. And they sent back official reports via ships to France uh, for over a period of 70 years. And these documents are collectively known as the Jesuit relations. And when we examine them, uh, these, these documents, we often uh, have a negative portrayal of First Nations people. Here's one example for you. In 1866, Gabriel Sagard described Huron Indians as faithless savages and barbarians that require enlightenment by teaching them about Christian faiths and beliefs. Residential schools. Now, this is important to keep in mind because this residential school legacy uh, it, it continues to have impact to this various day. And these residential schools were comprised of a network of forced boarding schools for Indigenous people as young as five years old. Uh, and the um, school system was supported and funded by the government's Department of Indian Affairs and administered by Christian-based churches. So just imagine for a moment that you're five years old, or, you, or even as a parent, if you're five years old, and it is required by law to send your child, uh, you know, to these residential schools, which may be located, you know, literally, you know, miles or hundreds of miles from, from your community. Uh, you're told you're not allowed to speak your native language anymore when you arrive here, uh, etc. It, it was devastating on, on all ends. It affected parents, it affected children, and, and continues to do so to this various day. The main objective was to convert or assimilate Indigenous children to Western ways, beliefs, religion, and culture. Um, these schools were deemed compulsory between the years 1884 to 1948, but continued to exist in many parts of Canada afterwards. And the last residential school in Canada was actually closed only in 1996. So what are some of the impacts when well, we recognize it today? There is currently a consensus in Canada from indigenous groups, survivals and uh, survivors and the federal government that these residential schools did result in significant harm to children in attendance by forcibly removing them from their families, their ancestral languages, culture and traditions, and exposing many of them to physical, emotional, sexual, and spiritual abuse at the hands of priests, nuns, vicars, clergy, and other church officials and teachers. The Indian Act of 1876 was passed by Parliament to ensure that the terms and conditions of all signed existing treaties with Indigenous people were legally observed and enforced. The Act assumed that Indigenous people were incapable of governing themselves. Hence, it was highly paternalistic in nature and intention. Indigenous life expectancies in here in Canada, to give you a snapshot of, snapshot of what is currently happening across Canada. Well, the life expectancy is approximately 10 years less in comparison to non-Indigenous Canadians. Indeed, there is growing incidence of diabetes mellitus, heart disease, stroke, sexually transmitted infections, and various mental health challenges as well. Here's one example, mental health challenges. 
uh, facing uh, uh, Indigenous people in Canada. If we look at all Canadian rates, this is the rate per 100,000 uh, for suicide as one of the mental health challenges examples. Uh, we see it's approximately 12 per 100,000 for all non, for all Canadians. Um, the First Nations is 24, so it's twice as high already. Uh, and if we look at the Inuit population uh, up, up in Canada's north, it is, uh, is, it is extremely high. I wish to thank you all for listening uh, to this lecture, and I hope that you listen to other lectures related to public health in this mini lecture series. All right, thank you.